Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Jason, welcome to the Australian Investors Podcast. Oh, and great to be here. It is indeed, mate. It's, uh, it's good to finally put a conversation on air. Um, you actually did appear, I shouldn't say welcome because this isn't your first time here, although it's your first long form interview. Uh, you actually appeared, I think you were at the Fresh Air office and you explained Stocklight, the app that you have created. And that was part of a session that we did in our investor bootcamp. So you have appeared on the show before, but now this is the time where we actually discover a bit more about you and what you've created over many years. Um, I've got some quick fire questions to start off with before we get into your journey. So my first question for you is, mate, if you were starting out in software development right now, what would you learn? So where would you start your discovery of kind of what tools you need, uh, the knowledge that you need? Good question. I'd be thinking a lot about what is needed in terms of software out there. There's huge potential for all sorts of businesses that aren't there yet that could be built and I think if you work backwards from um, all the opportunity of all the digital software that's missing well you think well what would I learn that would help me build the software that's missing I think personally the the biggest opportunity is learning how to build web apps how to build a functional website that has some relatively complicated functionality maybe a purchasing capability and web apps, there's lots of different ways to build them. There's heaps of different technologies that you can use to build web apps, but technologies like Ruby on Rails, uh, Python and Django, Node.js, React, uh, there's all sorts of different technologies that you could look at. And in terms of which ones to focus on, I don't think it really matters too much. Like if I was interested in getting into this as a career, and personally, I can't imagine doing anything else. I love building software. It's it's my passion. But if I was interested in getting into this as a career, I'd be thinking, where are the jobs? What sort of job listings are there on Seek? How many jobs are available? How much do they pay? Are they hiring junior people? And then I'd be drilling in a little bit to those technologies and thinking about, well, how can I get really good at that? Because someone who's looking to hire someone into the industry is looking for one thing. They're looking for competence. They're not looking for a degree. They're not looking for um, a particular workplace on the resume. They're looking for ap actual aptitude. Can you do it? And the way to prove that you can do it is to do it. You just build something. So if you can teach yourself how to code and you can build yourself a, a little app, even if no one's using it, if you can demonstrate that app to potential employers, I think that makes you employable. And it also gives you the skill set that you need to potentially go and build something big mm. yourself. Mm. Well, um, we're going to get to how you got into the industry in just a moment. But I did ask you off air, what are the three most popular programming languages? It was Python. Uh, there was JavaScript at number three. And number two was Java. But number four, which was close, was C Sharp. Um, Ruby, which I know you've done a presentation on and I'll link to in the show notes, uh, was fairly low down the, the list, but we'll explain why maybe that um, is kind of emerging as well. Uh, so my second quick question for you is, who is the most impressive technologist you've ever met and why? Well, it depends if it's in person or not. If we're talking about not quite in person, I think the to me the most impressive technologist of my generation that um, really captures my attention is Ray Kurzweil. And I've been reading Ray's Kur Ray Kurzweil's books for decades. Right. And once I plucked up the courage to email him and ask him some pointed questions about you know, his future you know, visions, the singularity and all the rest of it, and he was so kind to answer me. And hmm. I guess that would be the, the, the not in-person uh, technologist. But in terms of people that I've um, actually you know, had relationships with, I think um, I, I was really impressed with... Um, working with Marty Howe, who was the founder of 
rea real estate.com.au mm-hmm. uh, the technical co-founder he, you know he built it in the garage in Doncaster at the beginning and um, he was someone that I worked with for a number of years and learned quite a lot from mm. yeah great I think you'll come up throughout the conversation um, there is one thing I'm going to jump ahead of time and I'm going to ask you a question um, and it's about an experience that I know you had and then we'll we'll come back and we'll, we'll reframe this but did you expect that Facebook would grow to as big as it did when you were invited to apply for a job <laughs> no um well, yeah i guess one of uh my big regrets is i, I did get offered the opportunity to interview uh for a, a software engineering position at facebook in 2008 when they had about 100 engineers and they were called the facebook like in the movie and they were only available to universities but at the time i was really unimpressed with their technology selection being php and i was very really, really unimpressed with their lack of business model at that time. I thought to myself, there has been epic, epic failures in this space in terms of MySpace and Friendster being the two preceding sort of social networking technologies that were huge and Mm. burnt a lot of money and didn't have any sort of revenue coming towards their way. And I just thought to myself that social networking, how are they ever going to make money out of that? Mm. And here we are. One of the biggest companies in the world. That's okay. Um, we all have regrets and I think we live with them and that's what makes us human. Um, so there are so many, I guess, directions this conversation could go in because not only are you the founder of Australia's, one of Australia's biggest investment apps, um, most highly rated, we, we will say, um, you've had so much experience across a range of different things. I was watching the interview or the, the presentation that you did and you said just as an offhand uh, remark that you built and sold a website and I went and looked at the website and I was like, whoa, this is actually really impressive. And you just kind of so- mentioned that offhand. Um, I want to ask you to go back in time, but I'm hoping that you can, uh, maybe if you can do it off the top of your head, uh, just explain the concept of the cash flow quadrant before we start uh, your story. Because then your story, I think, plugs into those quadrants over time. So what is the cash flow quadrant? I find the cash flow quadrant to be uh, one of the, the most interesting concepts that has really changed my life uh, for the better, I think. Um, mm. There's this book, it's called Rich Dad, Poor, D- Poor Dad Cash Flow Quadrants, written by Robert Kiyosaki some time ago. Mm. And one theme that I noticed when I was meeting a lot of successful people earlier in my career was consistently when I asked them for recommendations on books, this was a book that consistently came up that had changed their thinking about how they approached what they do. And the book is really simple. It just presents this really simple concept of a box and there are four squares in the box. And the four squares represent the different types of ways that we can earn money. And Most of us are stuck up in the top left square, the default square as employees and we work for someone and we draw a wage and if we don't get paid next month, we might not make our rent and Mm -hmm. we're really reliant upon that wage and there's not a lot of upside to be had. We're, We're fairly static in what we're earning. And that was me for a long time in my career and that's me again at the moment, surprisingly enough, although I've been through all four quadrants. Um, The next quadrant down being this concept of uh, self-employed. So effectively, you're doing the same thing. I'm a software engineer, but rather than working for someone and drawing a wage, I can work as a contractor and I might charge $1,000 a day and make more money overall over the year. But that self-employed quadrant on the left side of this box of cash flow quadrants also not not uh, as quite as desirable as the stuff on the right because your money is directly tied to how much effort you put in and you can't make money unless you're putting in effort. And so as soon as you stop working as a contractor, you stop getting paid. So again, you're a little bit month to month in terms of how your money's coming in. But then on the right side of the quadrant, there are these other concepts of how you can earn. And it was very revolutionary to me to, to think about putting myself on that side, which is this idea that you can be a, a business owner or a part business owner. And in, in my case, that's owning Stockwide or you know the business you mentioned previously, bank location maps, or having a, an equity stake in my current um, job at Fresho and previous gigs at um, in, in Silicon Valley when I used to work in the States. But this idea of having some equity in a business and that business has value above and beyond the work that you're personally doing. So 
everyone else in the business, you can think about their success is my success. And I, you know, I, I regularly think um, in businesses like Fresho, where we've got a whole bunch of really successful salespeople who are constantly making sales. Every time they make a sale, I, I, I think to myself, wow, they just made a sale and X percent of that sale is going to me because I have some ownership of this business. And that's a really, really exciting place to be, um, I think, because then you can um, make make money above and beyond the work that you're doing. And then the fourth and um, hardest to get into, I think, quadrant is this idea of investing, which Rask is all about. But this idea that if you can um, be a little bit clever about spending less than you earn and putting that money in places, into businesses that are going to be profitable, well, um, hopefully you can get some nice returns out of it. And once you have a bit of capital behind you, a lot of people will move purely into that quadrant and just be investing and not working for anyone, not self-employed, not running a business, just investing in other businesses. And that's a very desirable quadrant. I think it's a really interesting concept. Yeah, we've uh, in Australia, we're fortunate to have superannuation. So some people get 10% of their wage put into that thing, which makes them money. Um, and then there are people like who listen to this podcast that are going in that direction as well. I think that third quadrant though, the one where they run their own business, there are a lot of listeners on this, this podcast that have their own business, uh, including ourselves, but also uh, there are people that want to do that as well. And they see that as something that's really interesting. So um, let's go back in time now. Let's, let's frame this conversation and let's understand a bit more about who you are. So my understanding is that you learned programming in the late 90s, but you mentioned something via email last night, which is, which struck me as interesting because it seemed like from the comment that you made last night that entrepreneurialism, if I can say that correctly, was part of your kind of your DNA. It seemed like software engineering and software was just an expression of that coming out um, and it was at the right time as well. But you mentioned something that you developed this concept of kind of solving problems and building things or supplying things that, that help people and create value. So can you go back in time, uh, younger Jason, when did you develop that habit and what was some of the kind of, how did that kind of express itself in your childhood? Uh, I can I can think of one particular event which was really fortuitous. It was It was really just complete luck. I mean, my family going back are employees and shepherds and serfs and like you know we, we don't have a lot of history of business in my family mm -hmm. but I got really lucky um, when I was in primary school one day I bought my table tennis gear into the classroom because I was a member of a table tennis club mm -hmm. and I started playing table tennis with one of my you know one of the kids I went to school with and everyone wanted to join they're all like oh this is great um, yeah, table tennis sure. looks like so much fun and when you're in primary school there are the crazes like yo-yos and yeah whatnot. for sure and I started a table tennis craze by bringing in two bats and a ball. Everyone wanted in. And somehow I got really lucky and sort of thought to myself, well, I've got like a, you know, $2 a week pocket money. I could take that $2 and buy 10, 20 cent table tennis balls. Or maybe I could, you know, try and save up a few weeks mm. pocket money and buy a $5 table tennis bat at my table tennis club. And I did that and then bought it into school and then I'd resell it for a premium, <laughs> make myself a nice little profit and everyone would be playing table tennis. And the objective I was after wasn't to make money. It was I wanted everyone to be playing table tennis. And so I guess I created the market for table tennis in my school with one of those little crazes. But um, I've subsequently come to learn that I think that in order to sell into a market, sometimes it's necessary to seed that market and create interest. And for me, that was a really formative experience of um, having a little entrepreneurial success early on in my life. And then there was probably another moment um, later on when I guess my parents were pretty strict about TV and Nintendo and all that sort of stuff. Didn't get to do any of that. And I, when I was 12, you know, I was old enough to get my first job. So I got a $4 a week paper round. And then when I was 13, I was old enough to get a morning paper round and get up at five every morning. And I used to earn $3 a day doing an hour of paper round up and down hills. <laughs> wow. Yep. And keeps you fit. <laughs> keeps you fit, yep. And I really wanted a Super Nintendo so badly and a TV. And so at that time, I was really into basketball cards. I love basketball. And I, I somehow lucked into this opportunity again of uh, creating a market for basketball cards at my high school by 
I would buy cards by the box. So you get a discount, 100, 100 bucks for a box of 50 packs of cards. Then I'll take them to school and sell them for a premium. And um, I would fund that through my paper rounds and take the profits and put it towards a Super Nintendo, which I ended up buying. Hmm. And um, yeah, I, I remember one particularly interesting thing, which was uh, the boss of the news agent, the owner, he used to have this paper weighing machine and the paper weighing machine would measure the weight of an envelope to the milligram, you know, like really finitely. And so he'd say to me, Jason, I, I, I can pay you your $3 a, a day paper round wage, or if you want, I can give you that $3 a day paper round wage in basketball cards, which I sell. And I was like, oh, uh, okay. And then he was like, but I'll make it good for you. We'll weigh all the packs in the deck, and we'll find the deck. We'll find the we'll find the pack that has the heavier card, which is the holographic oh, one, wow. which is worth more money. And so he used to do that for me, and I used to get all the holographic cards, which was a bit, I guess it, w it was a bit <laughs> dodgy, <laughs> but I'd take them to school and you know make make bank on selling them. Wow. That's, that's incredible. Where do we get these scales from? That's, uh, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. So how long did it take you to get the Super Nintendo? Uh, it was about um, a year and a couple of weeks. And I just remember it being a completely momentous occasion because it was a bit of a, yeah, up yours to my parents. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to get one whether you like it or not. <laughs> they couldn't do anything about it. That's fantastic. It's, uh, uh, yeah, well, so it's it started pretty early for you. And uh I like that's that's creativity as well in that mix. It's not just like a you know a humble uh, kind of lemonade stall or something like that. Uh, so where did you go from there? You did you have a passion for engineering or software or anything like that in high school? Well, no, I was planning on being a professional basketball player. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but unfortunately, I reached my my ceiling in terms of uh, talent, and um, then when high school wrapped up, I I thought. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I really like it how people wear suits and go into the city like yourself. Mm -hmm. And I thought I want to do that. And okay. so I just randomly enrolled in computer science, not having done any programming at all prior to enrolling in computer science at uni. And I think retrospectively for people who are interested, younger people who are interested in getting into the vocation, take an IT class in high school and uh, yeah, maybe, maybe give it a try before you buy because at university, I think it was maybe 30 or 35% of the people who enrolled ended up graduating and the rest of them dropped out to do other careers, possibly yeah, right. possibly like yourself, Owen. Yeah, well, that's actually interesting. So when I did, when I was in, I think it was, because I eventually started a master's of IT and we got to one of the harder programming classes and the professor said in the first lesson, he's like, I think 85% of you won't finish this class. I think you'll just swap. Um, and I feel like he was right. I think it was like .NET or something. It wasn't very difficult in terms of like the programming tasks, but a lot of people didn't go through with it. So that's, that's yeah, I think that I can see how that would play out. So you enrolled in computer science. At the time, I would have imagined that um, it would have been a pretty steep learning curve. It was a, it was a really steep learning curve for the first year, but um, programming is this beautiful art that um, there's generally one right answer. Well, well, you know, there's different ways of doing things, but your program either works or it doesn't work. And I found that really satisfying being able to um, do something like that. And I had this sort of pivotal moment at the end of my first year of uni where I really wanted to challenge myself to understand what I was doing. I think if you're a bit passive about anything that you do and you don't go, after, go out and get it, you're not going to have success. And at the end of my first year, I loved this game called Minesweeper. And oh, yeah. so I built my own version of Minesweeper, which was actually an internet-enabled Minesweeper and people were playing from all over the world on my Minesweeper and it was like the... Oh, it, wow. Yeah, it was really cool. Like it was the most popular Minesweeper in the world circa 1999. And that gave me the confidence um, and skill set to go and apply for work. And so my second year of university, I took a full-time job doing software engineering and I did my full-time course load at night. Hmm. And wow. so, um, yeah, I guess I was pretty busy from that point on. I can't believe you just dropped that in like, yeah, I built the world's most popular Minesweeper. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the most popular Minesweeper anymore, but at the time there wasn't a lot of competition for web stuff. Like the, the internet wasn't that big back then. Yeah, right. Okay. So you knew that's a pretty strong indication that you may have been onto something. Like if you were to look at that and you think people actually like what I've created. Now, I don't know if you monetize that. Did you monetize it? Oh, of course not. No. no, no it was probably too early for that anyway as an ecosystem. Okay. So you started work second year of uni which is pretty still pretty popular now isn't it that when you get through your computer science degree people 
are pretty in demand, so they go and try and get experience? Yeah, well, it's it's a bit tough to get that first job. I would say that in general, employers don't want to hire someone who has no um, commercial experience or um, you know demonst- demonstrable experience. And that's why I say that it's so important that if you want to get into this vocation, that you have some sort of passion project like Minesweeper or you know, an investment website or an app or something that you build that you can demonstrate and say, hey, I did this. And then people can look at it and go, wow, it would have been complicated to build that, show me the code. And that gets you, that gets you in the front door. But if you just go through the motions, enroll in uni, you know, get passing grades or good grades and then apply for jobs, there's nothing that separates you from the bazillions of other graduates who are looking for work. And it's really hard to get your first job. Yeah, for sure. So you continued and I'm assuming you finished the degree. That's right. Yeah, I finished it um, at night. So I, I would jam all my classes into one day a week and do all my work at night. But it was pretty easy once you get the hang of it, I think. Um, I found it, I, like, I guess it re- resonated with me. I found it easy. And then I went into um, building software professionally. So I used to work for, to begin with, uh, Pacific Access, formerly Census. It's a Telstra directories business, yellow pages, white pages. I went on to build insurance software for a number of years, which was really interesting. I, you know, I got the opportunity to to work in the US as part of that business as a young person. And um, subsequent to that, one of the people who I'd worked with at Census went over to the States, and uh, which was very fortunate for me. I mean, my, my whole life, I feel very lucky about everything that's happened, but I, I have this really strong um really strong perspective on luck, which is luck is the intersection of preparation and opportunity. And I feel like throughout my life, I'm constantly trying to prepare for my next opportunity. And sometimes they come up and sometimes they don't. But I got really lucky with um, someone who, who I worked with here in Melbourne and he was working over in California. And I was over in the US playing basketball for a couple of months just doing street ball um, yeah cool actually if you look up street ball on google you'll see my photo number one <laughs> <laughs> but, but i was over playing basketball in the u.s and microsoft somehow figured out about me i'm not sure how and they flew me to california to work on hotmail they said hey we want to hire you for hotmail but while i was there i actually met up with this colleague from melbourne and he was part of a, a startup that was much smaller than microsoft this is 2006 and uh he convinced me that the funding that they had from Sequoia Capital, which is one of the world's premier venture capitalists, indicated that it was a you know a really exciting business to be part of. And I joined a, a Silicon Valley company and moved to the States. Hmm. Wow. So this is where things started to get really interesting too, because I think you started to immerse yourself in that um, world, I guess. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you were playing like indoor soccer or something as well with some people that were in the industry as well. Um, how does... How do you go, because we brought it up at the top of the show, like having the conversation with people from Facebook, how does how do you get from where you are at this point of the story to Facebook? Yeah, it's, it's, it's again, fortuitous. Um, with Sequoia Capital, they have this incredible um, affiliation with Stanford Business School. And Stanford Business School is a Masters of Business Administration, which has lots of really talented people that go into it. But most of those Stanford MBAs end up um, spread throughout all the businesses that Sequoia fund. And we had a lot of Stanford MBAs who were associated with the business that I was in. And they're really cliquey. It's like an incredible network of people to become involved in. And, And I would recommend that You know, if you really, really want to be really, really successful, just go and get a Stanford MBA if you can. And I promise you that jobs will, jobs and opportunities will be coming your way. But some of the people who are involved in our business through the Stanford MBA program, um, one of the, the, the people who I worked with, he, he was part of a weekly pickup outdoor soccer game and I like playing sports, so I joined. And uh, another person who organised the game every week, his name was Keith Rabois. And Keith is one of the original PayPal mafia, along with Elon Musk and um, Max Levchin and Chad and, you know, the guys who started YouTube. And, yeah, he's a really nice guy. <clears throat> we used to, used to play soccer every week and... Um, we, you know, we maintained a relationship just through the weekly soccer game. And one day he invited me to his place in San Francisco, which was mind boggling because he's a billionaire. And so it was a pretty impressive place. And there were a lot of people at this party that he he, he had and he wanted me along because I was a software engineer. And he's like, oh, well, I'm connecting some software engineers I know with potential em- employers. And I got the opportunity to speak with a bunch of people who were trying to recruit me 
for jobs. And one of um, one of the people who was there worked for Facebook, and yeah, they, that was the the opportunity right there. They were like, "Hey, Jason, we've got this. I've got the business card at home. You know, we've got this thing, the Facebook." And I'm like, "Yeah, I've heard of you. You know, you're the college social networking thing." He's like, "Yeah, we want you to come and interview." And I'm, I was just like, thanks. <laughs> no worries. <Yeah. laughs> Maybe not. So, what, so, so did anything come of that, that, I guess, that party or that, that outing? Did you meet anyone else that then took your interest and you went in that direction? Or? Oh, Max Levchin tried to hire me for Slide, which was his business, which subsequently went pretty big and got acquired. But I knocked him back as well. It wasn't of interest. And um, subsequently, some of the people who I'd been working with at Sequoia Capital, um, Sequoia was interested in Funny or Die, which was this, basically it was a video um, that Will Ferrell created. It was the most popular video at the time um, with his daughter, Pearl. And Pearl is like the landlord. And it's this, it's this video that um, Will Ferrell, I think Adam McKay, put together with his daughter, Pearl. And it's very funny. And it blew up. And they thought, oh, there's a business here. We can create YouTube for comedy videos. And so they asked me and one of my friends if we could build something for it. And so with my friend, we built the first version of Funny or Die. And I got offered the first engineering role in the company. And at that time, I think I got offered um, a quarter of a percent of the business vesting over four years. And I did the math and I'm like, well, over four years, if this becomes a $100 million company, maybe I'll get $250,000 before tax. Really, that's not that exciting for a business that hasn't proven itself yet. And so... Um, Funny or Die went on to be relatively successful, but I knocked them back and um, moved on, moved back to Australia. So you helped build kind of the first instance of that um, and you thought, okay, you weighed it up, yeah, zero. Was it a quarter of 1%? So, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, but so what was the motivation to come back to Australia then? Because I imagine the Australian scene wasn't that big, in, like not in, in relatively speaking at least. You know, for software engineering at the time? Or yeah, was it? I, I think the, the motivation was like, while I'd learnt heaps of, in the States, and the thing I really appreciate about Americans is their go get them attitude. It's really, um, it's really impressive when you go to the US that everyone thinks big. They think so big. They're like, I, I don't want to be mediocre. I want to be in the NBA. I don't want to be mediocre. I want to be a movie star. Like everyone's really got this drive and passion to achieve great things. And not everyone does it, unfortunately, but they really. They, they take risk and they go after it. Now, I think that level of entrepreneurialism was inspiring to me. And um, that, that was something I learned a lot from. However, I was really missing family and friends from back home. And that was the reason I came back to Australia and spent, yeah, I, I guess I got back to Australia and I'm, I, I, I spent the next couple of years trying to start my own thing and unsuccessfully like just failing for the next couple of years stuck in a bedroom trying to build real estate software so yeah right yeah so was this when you went when you met martin or was this that's right yeah, yeah. so i'd been in my bedroom like just trying to create real estate software to go into competition with realestate.com.au and domain.com.au and i thought oh there's a much better user experience available here which i can demonstrate but what I, what I really learned at that point in, as part of that failure is you can create the best software in the world, Owen, you can create the best software in the world, but if you can't sell it, it's worthless. And something I learned about myself at that point in time is, oh, I'm really getting the hang of this building software stuff, but the selling software stuff is almost more important than the building software stuff. And at that point, I was introduced to Marty, who um, yeah co-founded realestate.com.au, and he was a a really interesting guy who was um, who became a business partner. We worked together for a while in this business called Rapid Mango and hired a bunch of engineers and built real estate software. But I just I just remember so many interesting things about Marty. Can you share some of those with us? Um, yeah. So Marty Marty has just a a really entrepreneurial approach to life. Marty won't cook his own food. He won't cook a meal in his house because he doesn't want to spend the time preparing and cooking the food. So Marty gets like, he, he, well, at the time, he used to get like a month's worth of lean cuisine delivered to his house and he just microwave every single meal. I'm like, Marty, what are you doing? He's like, why, why are you eating that crap? And he's like, well, I haven't got time to cook, Jace. I've got more important stuff to be doing. I should be building businesses. And, <laughs> you know, he, he was the, the type of guy who'd done really well. I remember... One time we were, uh, 
<laughs> one time we we're at the we we're at the races at the Victorian races at the Melbourne Cup and he you know he met this girl and he was really taken she was lovely and they ended up in a relationship he's like oh Jason this she's she's really lovely I get on with her so well but she lives in this like fairly remote part of Queensland you know she's down down here for the cup and I want to be able to see her a bit more easily I'm like oh what are you going to do about that Marty and he's like I think I'm going to buy a plane <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay. he's like i'm like well, have you got a pilot's license buddy he's like yeah and he was like completely dead serious and you know he's the kind of guy who he loves skydiving so on the weekends he'd go to uh Uroa where he's got a farm which he ran profitably like remotely with no people on it he just had cow on it and liked to turn a profit on it he'd just jump out of planes all the time he was just a really interesting character yeah right and so what he would the idea would be that he would fly to, to queensland to see his girlfriend. That was the idea. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> so, and because I assume that he would have done pretty well from co-founding REA Group. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, he could have afforded to do anything um, basically that he wanted. It, and I think there was another thing I think I picked up. He didn't actually own the place where he was living, right? Yeah, that's Yeah, that's pretty interesting too. So, um, when we started this business, it was me and Marty and four or five engineers and we were working out of an apartment on St Kilda Road here in Melbourne like a fairly nondescript two-bedroom apartment and I, I kept wondering to myself Marty and I, I asked him I'm like Marty you, you know you're probably the wealthiest person I'm friends with like why is it that you've got this apartment which you don't even own he was renting it hmm. and at the time he was like well Jason I've done the math and if I was to own this home it would cost me more than it does to rent it when you take into account the interest and you take into account the expenses associated with owning it, the body corporate, the rates, I can rent it cheaper than I can own it. And so why would I own it? Yeah. When the, the default answer would be, well, I've got money, I could buy it if I wanted to. Um, and that's what I'd do. So it's interesting just looking at it. And this is once again, uh, I guess, for a lot of engineers, you look at things and it's a problem that you can solve and you're like, well, what are the numbers? How do I rationalize this how do i break it down um and i guess that's an expression of that too like the australian dream is own your own home right so whether it's an apartment or a house uh, so that's interesting so okay so let's jump back to you then um you're building these property apps um or like programs but is it around this time or is this did this come later where you kind of like surveyed the the landscape because when, I'm, 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 not, I'm unsure if you built Stocklight first and then looked for other opportunities in industry for, for engineering or if it was the other way around. And you've got an anecdote of tying Stocklight together with someone that's been on this podcast before. Tying Stocklight together. With Graham. Oh, Graham, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Graham and Gaurav, who have both been on this podcast, I'll have to introduce you to Nathan, by the way, from Intelligent Investor. They're all terrific blokes and great analysts. But um, yeah, when I when I got Stocklight up and going, it was this this passion I have is investing. I love finance. I love investing almost as much as I love software and basketball, yep. probably on an equal footing. Yeah. <laughs> and I had this concept coming back from the States. I'd read this book, you know, The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham, and you know, I was well aware of Warren Buffett and what he did. And I thought a lot of these concepts in how you invest your money um, with these techniques described in terms of how to value businesses seem like they are uh, concepts that could be automated with software. Mm. And at that time, there wasn't a lot of software that was providing that sort of automation. I thought, I'm going to build something for myself. Yeah. And I want some software that's going to help me with make my own investing decisions. And so I started building quantitative analysis algorithms um, that would help me identify value in the market. And as part of doing that, other people saw it and thought, oh, that's really cool. And so um, they, they said, oh, Jason, I'd like to use that too. And at that time, this is like circa 2010, I thought I did a trip to Asia. Uh, I went rock climbing in Asia somewhere and I saw everyone in Singapore was using phones like nonstop on the train and that mm. hadn't happened in Australia, but they had the PDAs like where they could play around with their phones. And I thought phones and mobile is going to be the next big thing. And I think the, the perfect combination of um, investment and staying on top of your investment, staying, you know, staying... Uh, staying interested in what you're, what you're invested in is being able to have quick mobile access to your portfolio. And I thought, let's combine these things and I can have a go at this entrepreneurial stuff and I'm going to start my own business, which is to build a stock market app 
that I want because I didn't think the stuff that out there catered to what I wanted. And um, I went into business initially with Intelligent Investor, uh, who went through four changes of management while I was there. So the partnership ended ended um, eventually. But um, I was really fortunate to meet a lot of uh, amazing people like Graham. And Graham and I actually, yeah, we went to Berkshire Hathaway once, which is, I think, what you're referring to, and um, had a terrific time. In fact, Graham was a, a Berkshire Hathaway expert. And so we were at the AGM in Omaha, and he'd booked the accommodation like six to 12 months out, and I wasn't going to go if, if it wasn't for Graham. And he had a spare bedroom. He said, oh, a spare bed. And he's like, yeah, just come and stay with me, and we'll split it. And so we stayed at this dodgy sort of motel over the river, over from the convention center. And then we got up at 3 a.m. in the morning and did the 45-minute walk from where he booked the cheap accommodation to, to where the line began at like 4 or 5 in the morning. And then we lined up for hours before they opened the doors. And then Graham had it all down. He's like, Jason, what's going to happen is when they open the doors, everyone's going to go crazy. And we're going to sprint straight in. And then we're going to turn right. And then we're going to go back up the stadium this way and then we're going to go up the stairs and then when, once we go up the stairs we'll be able to get down the front and then we'll get a seat right at the front next to Buffett and Munger and I'm like sounds cool. good yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. cool <laughs> <laughs> and so we did this big sprint and we ended up with seats right in front of Buffett and Munger because Graham's just a, a Berkshire expert and mm. um, had a terrific time I highly recommend if, if you haven't had a chance already you've got to get to the Berkshire AGM before those guys are before those guys aren't around yeah yeah, absolutely. Um, I feel like the line might even be even longer now, uh, given the years that have passed and the the growth and the urgency of people to get there, particularly after COVID. So, I, w- I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, um, I, I'm sure there, there are many listeners that have gone on the trip. I was speaking to Scott Phillips from the Motley Fool last night. I saw him there in Omaha. I bumped oh, into Scott at, oh, uh, really? at, at the Berkshire Hathaway AGM. That's when I got to meet Scott. Oh right, okay. So yeah, I was chatting to him last night, and he was saying how he went and. Um, he saw that um, Rob Milner from Soul Pats was there and, you know, there's this entourage and just everyone from Australia was there. That was actually the almost one of the best parts of it for me. I mean, I didn't really meet any Australians other than Scott and Graham. This is 15 years ago, but the networking at Berkshire was incredible. I got to meet people who wrote for the Wall Street Journal and investment um, funds that manage billions of dollars. And it was just really incredible to have this this vibe and these people around that you could talk to about investing and get some really great ideas. And I remember at the time, I was speaking to someone who seemed very accomplished with their investing. And I, and I said, what's your best investment? Like, you know, what do, what do you think I should get into? What, what do you suggest? And he said, do you like Berkshire? And I'm like, yeah, I do. He's like, why don't you buy some more of that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's probably a safe option for him as well to, yeah. to give you that uh, advice. It worked out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you, so do you invest in Berkshire now? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So um, our investment portfolio is primarily Vanguard um, with a good chunk of Berkshire. We've got a bit of a gold hedge in terms of IAU uh, on the American Stock Exchange. A few smaller stocks to play around with like uh, Zero and um We've got a, a, a decent holding in Optiva, which is Nathan Bell's favorite little thing. Okay. And um, but and then very substantially fresher, which I can talk more about later, I guess. Yeah, for sure. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, okay, so this might actually be a good jumping off point for uh, talking about Stocklight. So because I think it's also an interesting dichotomy between the way you invest and what you've built. So you mentioned before that you built Stocklight as a way to quantitatively analyze companies, look for value in the market. Um, which it still does today. You can log into the app or you can go to the website and there's different, I don't know what you call those things, but like charts that like have like the dial that goes- Ratios. Up, ratios and all that sort of stuff, yeah. Um, so what is Stocklight then versus now? And then we'll get to yeah, investing. Yeah, so the original concept was the quantitative analysis aspect of it, but that aspect of it is basically entirely deprecated. Um, I, I think, you know, when you build a, any business, you're not quite sure what's going to stick. Mm. You want to figure out where your product market fit is. And early on, um, those that ratio stuff was pretty interesting, but um, it didn't really stick in terms of a viable business model. It wasn't um, as good as it could have been. And over the years, um, the, the product evolved to um, become more of a portfolio tracking app. Uh, there, there was one particular point I remember where you could – favorite stocks and that was always there from the beginning you could favorite stocks Mm. but then i added this really basic capability to just enter how many shares do you hold of this stock and we'll just do a little basic calculation 10 shares 10 bucks a share all right you've 
shares are worth a hundred bucks today. Yep. And people went wild over that. They, they loved it. They loved this idea of being able to see, um, I think their future, see their future in front of their eyes. Like when you're investing, you're thinking about your future. How can I retire? How can I look after my kids? Um, how long do I have to work for? And all of those concepts, I think, really boil down to a number. And that number is like, what is my portfolio worth today? How is it going? Like, you know, how am I going with that? And so along the way, more and more and more features were added to Stocklight um, to be able to track your portfolio. And importantly, I think, um, get really quality data. So the problem with um, a lot of the other finance apps out there and um I'm not going to name names, but a lot of the the content that you read and um, the, the content that you look at is computer generated, and it's not very high quality. It's 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 really low quality. What Stocklight aims to do is expose um, the actual data so that you can do your own research. So you can look at the dividend history for a company. But perhaps more importantly, you can read their annual report and you can read their price sensitive announcements and you can get sent an alert straight to your phone when stocks that you're interested in or invested in uh, release a price sensitive announcement or alert or a dividend or maybe an analyst releases an article about it and it gets pushed to you in real time and allows you to make a decision um, about whether you want to do something about that. I feel like the first time we met, um, I think the thing that I was blown away with was the analytics that you got to see on the back end. So... You could see what you know, what people are following, which companies are interesting to people. Um, I found that to be fascinating. Do you have any like s- sense, or can you give us any sense of um, the size of the ecosystem that you've built? Yeah, Stocklight. Um, I haven't looked at it in a while because I'm I'm not on the numbers as much as I used to be because I've got a, a one year old and a full time job and volunteer at a basketball club and do a hundred million other things. But um, Stocklight tracks billions of dollars worth of retail portfolio on behalf of Australian investors. And I think um, there's some really interesting data as part of that um, as part of that database in terms of who's investing in what, what are they getting in and out of? Because you can actually do some retrospective analysis and say, well, if people are tracking their holdings in Stocklight as a portfolio manager, which people are successful and which people are not? And those people who are successful, what are they investing in? And are there any threads there? Like, is there any common threads? And so I actually uh, did a bunch of this analysis with the Stocklight data set and I thought, oh, wow, this is actually quite interesting. I mean, I wonder if um, this would be an indicator for things that are worth investing in. And um, as a result, I um, burnt my fingers and uh, threw some money at Fast Brick Robotics <laughs> <laughs> because I thought it looked like an interesting business. I think it's a cool technology, but they, you know, they failed to commercialize. But um, I think there's a wealth of data in in there. And um, you know, I mean, I've actually got one user who um, who I talk to a fair bit, he gives me calls regularly and um, he's got an $80 million portfolio and he checks Stocklight a dozen times a day and he just loves the you know the, the, the ease of use of being able to quickly see how his $80 million portfolio is doing. But by, you know, by no means is he the, the average user. People use Stocklight um, for $1,000 portfolios, $0 portfolios and everything in between. Mm. Um Fascinating stuff. I, I, I can imagine the, the number of users. It's um just one more thing on the, the product side. It wasn't always web based, was it? Because like recently you've rebuilt the the platform and you've got this huge web presence now as well, which I believe is not just in Australia, it's all around the world. Um, can you talk us through that? Like how did people find you and where, how has it changed? Yeah, it's funny. I have a zero dollar marketing spend. And so um, people find Stocklight typically through the App Store because it's the highest rated stocks app for iOS and Android in Australia. And so because people love it, because it's a good product that solves a problem for them, they give it a good review. And because it has good reviews, it ranks highly in the App Store. And because it ranks highly, people download it. And so it's sort of self-fulfilling, has a bit of a network effect in terms of um, acquisition of customers through the mobile side. But recently I did um, launch a web interface to the product and the future for Stocklight. When I can find some time to do it, I guess, you know, post fresh at some point in time, is I'd really like to... Um, massively extend the portfolio management aspect of the app. Um, I think I'd like to go into direct competition with ShareSight. I think ShareSight do a pretty good job of that. And I think, you know, a better job is possible. And so that's what I'd love to do when I find the time. <laughs> yeah, right. 
there is actually so there isn't uh, something that you you sent through, or you, you kind of put it in the Google Doc that we're working on, which is something you touched on the Ruby on Rails chat that you or the presentation that you did. Um, which again, I'll put the link in the show notes. But you talked about the concept of time being precious, and maybe this is a good time to talk about that because obviously you're someone that has the skills to build things, right? Things that thousands or millions of people can use. Um, but you're only one person, right? And you have a family, you have other pursuits and things you want to do. So how do you think about the allocation of time? It's a great question, and It's something I think about a lot. Time, I believe, is your most precious asset. I believe that if you offered Rupert Murdoch an extra year of life, he'd give you a billion dollars for it because it's invaluable. And you're born with 37 million minutes if you live to 70. So just think, you probably clocked half of them off already. So, you know, every single minute of your life is some minute that you should not be wasting. And the way I think about time is if you gave me and another good engineer infinite time, we could build Google. We could replicate Google exactly if you gave us infinite time, if we were good engineers. But just because we could replicate Google with infinite time doesn't mean we could go into competition with Google. There is a first mover advantage and there's an opportunity cost associated with spending a a lot of time on something when you could be spending that time doing something different. And so when it came to Stocklight, um, I have... I have so much enthusiasm for the future of Stocklight. I think it's going to be massive, much more massive than it is at the moment, and it's already huge. Um, But whilst I think Stocklight will be massive, one one thing um, that I think I've not done as well as I could have have is um, improved how I commercialize the business. I think it's got incredible reach, a great brand, and a terrific product, but, you know, I'm not making bazillions of dollars off it um it's it's paying a wage but you know it's not it could be paying more and i observed uh recently i was stuck at home for 10 years building stuff stock light without employees and stuck in my lounge room and i was really isolated and it was just doing my head in and i thought oh I, i need to you know interact with people get out of the house and do something new for a little bit regardless of the financial implications of that because stock light's probably my you know my biggest opportunity financially But I decided I want to get out of the house and just spend a couple of days learning things from other people. And I went out and I surveyed everyone in Melbourne who's using Ruby on Rails, which is my preferred technology. I think it's um, the premium technology to build web apps in, in my opinion. And I went out and saw, all right, who's doing what? And I'd I'd always been keeping tabs on all the companies that use Ruby on Rails uh, domestically. Like, you know, I got offered the first 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 job for uh, Redbubble here. I got offered the third or fourth job at Invado, which is a billion dollar company that you know came out of Melbourne. Um, I've been across a lot of businesses since they were nothing, and. I thought to myself, wow, Melbourne's really got really good engineers and and it's developing really good businesses. I should go and see what's out there. And I went out and surveyed like everyone that's using Ruby locally. And I came across, I I wasn't intending to take a job, but I came across this business, Fresho, which is uh, software for wholesale food suppliers to sell into their customers, venues like the one we're going to go to lunch to after this. Oh, right. And, really? Oh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Can I say the name? Yeah. Yeah, it's super normal here in Melbourne. Very good uh, recommendation if you're in Melbourne, super normal. Yeah, absolutely. And super normal order all of their produce, their meat, their seafood, um, their fruit and veg through Fresho. So their chefs over the road are constantly on fresh air every day like ordering produce from their suppliers right, okay. in fact the owners of um super normal meat smith are a really successful butcher a great case study for fresh air and fresh air basically is a software that um takes an antiquated industry which is like old mafia guys running fruit and veg yeah. <laughs> cash 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 mate cash <laughs> yeah. and it automates it for for the younger generation because a lot of the problem with um this industry is historically fruit and veg has been hey Um, can I place this order as a chef at two in the morning and leave it on the answering machine or send an SMS or send a fax and the order is incorrectly recorded, incorrectly picked at the warehouse, incorrectly delivered and hard to charge money for. You need an audit trail on all of this stuff and there's no software out there that's doing this. And so Fresho 
basically is a, a business that identified that there's this huge market opportunity for this massive industry. It's like a you know hundred billion dollar industry that has it's completely underserved and there's no competition. It needs software, and so the founders identified this, started building software, and. Now, a couple of years later, Fresho is doing over a billion dollars a year in food through the system for places like Supernormal or ordering off their vent, off their off their suppliers. And when I when I came across the business, I was like, oh look, I'm just looking for a day or two of contracting a week. And they said, oh, we can offer you a full time job, but we can't offer you a couple of days a week at that time. And I was like, this is. I, I asked for the numbers, like you know, how much are you making? At the moment, how much could you be making if you charge more money? And I did the calculations in my head. What's my valuation on this business based on where they're at today and where they could be with their uh, current customers and with their trajectory? And I just concluded that I think this is the next Facebook. I think it's going to be the next Google out of Australia. I think it's going to be the next Atlassian billion-dollar business. Uh, and so I just couldn't, couldn't say no to them. I said, okay, I'll take a full-time job. Um, but as part of that negotiation, joining Fresho, uh, it was really important to me to think about the cash flow quadrants and want to have some upside in the contribution that I felt I could make to the business. And so in terms of the negotiation for my position, I asked for an equity component in terms of stock options, but also because I had such firm belief, not just in the business model, it's got this network effect where venues order from their suppliers, those suppliers um, those suppliers start getting emails from Fresho, hey, you know, super normal's ordering food from you. And then they're like, oh, what's this Fresho thing? And they start using it. And then their other venues start using Fresho. And it's just got this network effect where it sells itself. And I, I, I thought, wow, this, this thing's so incredible. Not only that, it has the strongest technology team that I have ever come across. It has some people I really respect in the, in the Ruby on Rails community here in Australia working there. And... I thought, gee, this is all too good to be true. If I'm going to accept an employment offer here, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and I'm going to prepay my employment um, for a significant period of time. So I participated in the capital raising um, of Fresho, which is a very risky thing to do. I wouldn't encourage it unless you've got money to burn. But um, at that time, uh, you know, I didn't like the real estate market. I didn't want to spend on an overpriced house. And I thought, I, I think this is an incredible opportunity. And a business that's um, a private business like Fresho, that's uh, venture backed, you can't invest in it unless you're a, a high net worth um, classified investor, which means you've got millions of dollars, you know, investable funds uh, approved by an accountant. I didn't have that at the time. And so um, my way to get an opportunity to invest was to become an employee and employee and then ask if I can participate in the capital raising. And by being an employee in Australia, you can participate in a in a capital raising for your business if you're you know, the owners are willing to do that for you. And I, I managed to get in and um, I, I am really, really, really thankful I got that opportunity. I was very lucky about that as well. And now I work for Fresho full time and I do stock light at night. So a few questions around this. Um, pretty incredible that you prepaid your wage basically is what you did. Um, not only were you not looking for a full-time job, you took the full-time job and then paid <laughs> effectively your own wage into the business. Um, so I guess the few questions around this is, the first one is just a quick one. Does anyone work on Stocklight other than you? At the moment, I've got a couple of contractors who help me and they're incredible. Shout out to Rudy, Reese, and Karg and uh, thank you so much for helping getting get the latest app up and going. I couldn't have done it without you. Okay, so you've got these guys uh, working on the side, doing this, keeping Stocklight going. Um, and then you've decided, okay, I'm going to take this full-time job while having a baby. Um, so this comes back to the time thing, I guess, before. You must have saw, seen an opportunity set to spend time, effort, and capital with Fresho. How did you make that assessment? Did you, so was it just the valuation? Was it, was it that? Like, was it so overwhelming that you calculated that the return on effort, the return on investment with Fresho vastly outweighed the equivalent for Stocklight? Yes, at, at that time, yes, and and I, I'm glad I made that choice. However, there was an additional component to it, which was kind of funny, which was I really wanted to get out of the apartment and work with other talented people because for so long I'd been the number one engineer in any business I'd worked in and it's been so long since I've learned from anyone else and the engineering team at Fresho is 
incredible. And on a daily basis, I'm learning new techniques and new ways of building software and new things from the people that I work with. And for me, it was a learning opportunity as well. I feel like once you stop learning, you die. And I never want to stop learning. So it was a learning opportunity opportunity to get in on this investment that I think is going to be the next big one. And then it was also, uh, for me, a chance to get out of the lounge room. And then COVID hit and I was back in the lounge room for the next couple of years. <laughs> oh, full circle, here we go, back, in, back into the lounge room. Um, yeah, right. So now, I, because I think you're in a very interesting space, obviously being software, but um, when I look at companies throughout the world, I think of Companies like traditionally what we've seen is B2C companies like the Fang companies um, and many other software companies have made a lot of money from network effects that go to consumers. But increasingly, I see more technical style businesses emerging. So even Atlassian is a good example, right? Basically, developers building for developers. Um, and there are many instances like this. Uh, many examples, you know, like MongoDB, um, many of those big US companies. And I, I see like it's fresher. You're sitting between businesses, right? You're sitting in that space. B to B. Yeah. And I think your technical knowledge around software is a huge advantage, not just as, you know, for your career, but also as an investor. And I remember walking in Hawthorne, I think I was walking, I think I was with you at the time, or I was on the phone to you. Somehow I was chatting to you. And I remember you saying, I remember we started talking about Zero, the Australian slash Kiwi cloud accounting company. And at the time, Zero was going through this transition. I can't remember. I think they were moving to AWS from memory and we started talking about it and you said, yeah, if they can pull that off and they've done it so well, that is an incredibly strong signal to me. I'm not sure if you remember that conversation at all. I, I, I know what you're talking about. And so, I mean, I would, I would look at a, an incumbent like um, QuickBooks and, yep. you know, QuickBooks being, oh, sorry, not QuickBooks, um, MYOB. Yep. MYOB being software that you, you know, typically have on your desktop and you run it all locally as opposed to in the cloud and you can access it from anywhere. Mm. And that's really, it made sense 20 years ago. It doesn't make sense today. Yeah. Uh, any any business today wants to be on the cloud. And for, for a business like Xero um, and the accounting software that they provide, uh, I was incredibly impressed that they did manage to, to, to get off that like desktop software, move into the cloud. It's really hard to do. Um, but I think Xero to me is like a really uh, amazing business business it certainly um you know it hits its limits we we integrate with zero at fresher that's one of our key things is like uh taking away the the back office capability for wholesale food suppliers and integrating directly into their accounting system so they don't have to do anything yep. and at scale zero um does hit its limits but um for smaller um organizations and operations zero is absolutely superb i'm an in, you know i'm an investor in zero small yep. investor in zero and the thing i really love about zero is opening up stocklight and reading their annual report because when you read how zero talk about their numbers and their cost of acquisition and you know the, the way that they model their business I, I think it's just like it's like mba 101 it's like business class 101 is reading a zero annual report it's 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 a really beautiful thing Mm. Do you apply that lens, that the software filter, if you like, to any other companies, like domestically? Like you did it with Fresho, you've done it with Zero. Do you look at any companies overseas or here that you think, as an engineer, like I'm uniquely positioned to understand this business and I think it's really impressive? I, I've always been super impressed by AWS, um, the Amazon product. In fact, when Amazon released AWS, which is their cloud computing uh, capability, I thought to myself, this is game changer. Like, you know, it's a small aspect of Amazon's overall revenue, but it's going to, probably going to grow to be bigger than the, the rest of their business combined. It's just huge the, what this opens up. When, when the cloud came along, uh, and this is admittedly, this is like 15 years ago, when the cloud came along, that was game changer. And I still think that those businesses that operate cloud services, uh, Amazon, Google, Azure with Microsoft, even Tencent, um, they've got really, really, really um, fantastic businesses. It, it's, it's a huge lock-in effect. Once I'm building software and I'm reliant on Amazon and I'm paying them 100 bucks a month, 1,000 bucks a month, $100,000 a month or a million dollars a month, it's really hard to get off it. And so um, it really locks customers in and I'm, I'm a big believer in their businesses. There are some other software businesses that um, I really kind of like and that are doing cool things. For me, one really interesting um, innovation more recently is this concept of infrastructure as code. 
And what I mean by that is that um, there are cloud providers like Amazon and Google that are actually really complicated. Like once you get into the guts of it, like configuring how it's going to interface with your software and setting stuff up, we call that like provisioning the infrastructure, provisioning the services in Amazon that you're going to use. And historically, what you would have done is go into their very complicated interface and like try and find all the things and like click <laughs> around and like, yeah. you know, get stuck and someone might get in and accidentally delete something and then everything falls apart. It's really dangerous. Um, and now the whole world, banks and everything are running off these cloud services. So what you want is a way to reliably provision what's in those clouds. And that's infrastructure as code. That's instead of clicking around in their interface, it's writing a script and source controlling that script. And that script is responsible for talking to their API and then spinning up a server and you know giving it a domain name and making it serve traffic and storing its stuff in S3 and whatnot. And infrastructure as code, Amazon and Google, they, they provide their own toolkits for this, uh, cloud formations with Amazon, for example. However, they're not that great. And there's this business that I really like, um, which I use myself for Stocklight uh, quite considerably now. It's called Terraform. And um, I don't think Terraform's public, but I really like the technology that they've built in terms of they've got a community of developers worldwide who will build that integration with AWS and Google and whatnot. And you can provision um, services locally and then have Terraform scripts that just spin it all up in the cloud and make sure that it's source controlled. You don't stuff anything up. So that's one business that I really like. Uh, th there's a whole bunch of other tech businesses that I think are really interesting. I mean, Stripe's a massive one. We use um, Stripe at Fresho and the volume of payments that Stripe transacts is absolutely incredible. And I mean, you might argue that um, they've, they're such a monopoly in the business that maybe they're not offering the cheapest rates or offering um, customers the, the best prices that they could be, but they don't need to because they're such a monopoly. Mm. And they've got an amazing API for developers to quickly and easily integrate payments into software. And I think Stripe are a, a wonderful, wonderful business from an investment perspective, not taking aside the valuation aspect of it, I haven't even looked at it, don't know, but really beautiful business. And then there's other businesses that I think are interesting, like um, Elasticsearch is a, a publicly listed mm -hmm. um, search technology that gets used in a lot of places like Fresho. Interestingly for uh, Elasticsearch, I mean, Elasticsearch is – one that I got onto, um, there's the, there are a few things that I read like investment-wise, but one of them is Greenhaven Road, which is a an investor, and I really like reading um, the the reports that they produce, and they talk about Elasticsearch. And one of the interesting things with Elasticsearch is Amazon has built a competing product, um, and so I'm not sure what the future for Elasticsearch is like, but. It's another interesting. I could talk forever about like technology companies that that are interesting to me. It's a website called Full Stack Investing, which is really interesting. Um, he dives deep into a bunch of different like names, like MongoDB is on there. I think um, the Trade Desk and a bunch of others. Hate MongoDB. Yeah, why yeah. is that? Oh, it's just a it's 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 a technology that's suited to a a very specific problem that's very rare. And MongoDB is a technology that I believe has been um, incorrectly applied in many cases when a more traditional database would be more appropriate. And I think the hype over MongoDB was uh, something that did not impress me. Um, there was actually something completely off reservation that I wanted to ask you about. And I'm maybe going to do it. I, we're going to go for lunch after this. I was going to ask you then, but I'll do it now. Um, so one, one part of me when I look at your career and what you've done, I think of you learning to code in 98. Um, and I think you were at, you said, you know, prepare and your preparation and kind of guess luck. You were at a very, very, very critical part in our development as a kind of like a civilization and the technology where you learned these skills right at like when we were crossing the chasm on the internet, basically. And then you adopted it adopted mobile, you shifted cloud, all this stuff over time. One thing that I hear a lot of people talk about, and you know this, is basically the internet has evolved from read-only to read-write and so on and so forth. And people say that Web 3.0 is blockchain technology. I don't know if you have gone down this rabbit hole at all or if you have any opinion on this whatsoever. You might not. And in that case, we can come back in six months and talk about it. But... Do, do you see the way that we transact over like TCP, IP networks, the way we fundamentally use the internet changing? 
I have no comment on that. Okay. Maybe in time. I feel like so there's a thing that uh there's a thing that Jason does for listeners. Um when I very first met you, I realized that basically everywhere you go you have a notepad and pen. And you've got one right now, you've got a fresh old pen and you've got the paper. Um and he writes down basically everything that's like interesting. Yeah, you know, I remember when we first met and we we're doing some sort of session where we were talking about our businesses and whatever, and you just write down all these notes. It's like and I was thinking about it's it's you kind of like crystallizing these ideas or thoughts that you have in the moment and it's so like because you're an engineer and you can build things you're basically the algorithm is like get information and this is constantly on in an infinite infinite loop yeah it's 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 uh it happens to me all the time where you wake up like at three in the morning you're like oh i've solved that problem i was thinking about oh what about this idea and write something down and yeah right to-do lists how do you okay this is how do you keep a track of all these notes and thoughts and I mean, you got them on a piece of paper but i assume you'd have like a mountain of paper at home is there uh, anything else that you use not really no i don't have a mountain of paper like um i i have notebooks and sometimes i refer back to them but rarely um i i just find by when you put pen to paper it helps you really like if if, if you put something into words it helps you crystallize what that thought is it can be vague, but once you put it on paper, you have to really define what it is. And that process of putting pen to paper for me really just helps me understand what I'm thinking about better, even if I never come back to those notes. But you know, I do have plenty of to-do lists all over the place, and some of them have things that are years and years old. I've got a to-do list of, a, I think it's like 2,500 things that I want to do for Stocklight. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. and I haven't got around to it yet, but it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Big promises, two and a half thousand things. There's a lot of feature requests, mate. Um, so do you journal, morning or night? No, but I like to meditate. Um, just, you know, five minutes every morning and just sort of uh, plan my day and get pumped. I like to wake up in the morning and have a little routine where I think about what's going to happen. I think about my goals for the day. I think about how I'm going to achieve them. And then I just get super excited. And my, my wife gets, um, she laughs at me, but I often like, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say something out loud. Like, Let's go. Today's <laughs> going to be a terrific day. Ah. <laughs> just bringing the energy. I like it. I used to I used to have this um, thing that I, I did, which is uh, there's this hip hop preacher and he's got this, um, this breathe thing story that he tells about breathing and um you know how you've got to want stuff and i used to listen to that every single day like to start my day it was a bit of a mantra i like it well it's um yeah because you're so thoughtful about other things right and i think you know this is coming from rookie programmer over here that does next to nothing but when you learn to write uh code or program you begin to see that um good things take time and there are, like you say, there are ways to solve problems. It either works or it doesn't. But there are, within that, there are also dimensions of that where it's not necessarily 80-20. This is a big thing for, I think, um, investing in software. So anytime, I mean, there's this, there's this idea of um, any new business, like nine out of 10 businesses are going to fail, but any new business, you've got to reach that point of product market fit and you've got to reach it quickly before you run out of money. Yep. And what you know when software businesses are trying to reach that product market fit it's it doesn't make sense to spend bazillions of years like you know perfectly doing everything you take shortcuts and you rush till you get to the point where you think you've got a viable business and once you think you've got a viable business then it's like trying to stay in front of your competition and um, build something that's going to last and at the same time like grow your business and I think the um, like especially with software businesses and product software product businesses especially um, to me there's a there's a huge indicator of success which is um, how much time do you devote to the quality of the software and if you're going to rush your software out the door, that's great. Maybe you'll make money today, but in 10 years' time, is that software still going to be around? And I mean, from the fresh air perspective, that's one of the things that really attracted me. Like, you know, anytime we push um, a commit of code and change any little thing about the system, we spin up any little thing. You could change a label on the site. It will spin up 100 servers in Amazon and they will simultaneously run for a quarter of an hour and run a test suite that would take 24 hours to run otherwise and it automatically checks that every single behavior in our system is perfect because we can't misplace one cent for the transactions that we're facilitating and 
that level of quality that you might put into software is uncommon. It is really uncommon. There are a lot of places that you'll go and their software is has been cobbled together like band-aids on band-aids on band-aids on band-aids. And you're like, hey, Owen, can we like release this new feature? Oh, I don't yeah. want to touch that black box. I don't know how that thing works. And you get to this point where if your software is not really maintained with high quality, um, it just becomes, it stagnates and you can't change it. And mm. so it, it's an interesting thing to me. I see that. So dealing with um, many companies as part of our business, interfacing with other businesses and executives and whatever, and the non-technologists in, in the executive team are like, oh, we're just going to put this thing on the website. And then the developers down there are like, <laughs> just shivering. Like the, in the, the, the perfect <laughs> example for me is prior to Fresho, um, there was this other business that I really liked in Melbourne called TMAP. And uh, maybe you've heard of TMAP, but it manages sports clubs. Oh, yeah, I have. Yes, yeah, I have. Yeah, you yeah. probably got it on your phone. And so I built TMAP um, with other people and like I was quite involved in it early on. And the, the management of TMAP were constantly focused on growth growth, growth, more users, more features. And they're constantly asking for more features, more features, more features, more features, more features. And the problem with building more features all the time, rather than just focusing very clearly on the features that you've already got, is you create a quagmire of software that's just impossible to change. And so when it comes to Stocklight, for example, why is it still only a mobile app rather than a fully fledged web thing? I'm trying to keep it pretty focused until I have more resources available to, to extend it. But I think anytime you're building software, you should be thinking about how can we keep it really focused and not try to do too many things. Mm. I'd like to switch gears now as so we come towards the end of the chat and um, maybe just there's a, like a couple of books I want to talk to you about, but also um, creating one of Australia's biggest stock market apps, probably websites as well. Um, yet, uh, I think from my knowledge, you're a huge advocate of Vanguard. That's right. Yeah, like a, a primary um, percentage of our asset allocation in terms of investment is in Vanguard index funds. Um, I was very lucky <laughs> early okay. on to talk to someone at Melbourne Uni Basketball who was in finance and I said, hey, what do you what do you like in terms of investment? And he suggested Vanguard and I was like, what's that? And he's like, well, it's, this, it's the biggest money manager in the world um, and it's a not-for-profit. So their costs are lower than anyone else. And it's, it's, it's fair enough. And I think for a lot of engineers too, like you crunch the numbers, you figure it out and once you – you've got the facts in front of you. It's a pretty easy way to allocate um, a substantial amount of money. So like I don't I don't sit on either side of the fence, I guess. It's like, kind of like whatever you know, is horses for courses, so to speak. I speak to a lot of fund managers, speak to a lot of ETF providers and so on and so forth. An interesting thing there is uh, when the financial crisis happened, I redrew all the equity I had in my, in my home loan and uh, I put it all into Vanguard. And I'd read this book, which was hugely influential for me. It was probably one of the most influential books I'd ever read, which was A Random Walk Down Wall Street by Burton Malkiel. And one of the chapters struck me in particular because I was looking for like edges. And it talks about how small caps will generally outperform large caps because they've got more room to grow. And um, so, yeah, I took all that money and riskily as a, like just put it all into a small cap Vanguard fund and uh, it did really well, but I, uh, I didn't understand my risk profile <laughs> <laughs> properly at that time. Oh, well, that, I guess it maybe shows that your risk profile, maybe, maybe it's pretty high, you know. So um, good on you, mate. And, um, you know, even if, you know, you're investing one way, I think it's interesting because a lot of people say, a lot of really successful investors say, don't invest like I do. Um, like Warren Buffett basically says, put your money in an index fund, 90-10, right? Um, and I got a comment the other day from someone that said, I invest very differently to what it seems like I advocate for, which I thought was very interesting too. And I was like, well, you know, right. I, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah you've, your incentives are wrong there. I mean, I think the really interesting thing about a random walk down Wall Street that sort of codifies why an index fund makes sense is because if you're investing actively – if you're, if you're investing in actively managed money or a fund or whatever, generally those funds are managing lots of money. Think about your superannuation. Your superannuation is managing billions of dollars. And when you're moving billions of dollars around, you can only invest in opportunities that have massive liquidity. And opportunities that have massive liquidity are the top end of the market. And the top end of the market has bazillions of investors who are very closely analyzing the numbers. And the top end of the market is generally quite fairly priced. Whereas the bottom end of the market, the cheaper stuff, 
a little bit more opportunity to get a good investment because there's less people looking at it, but the big funds can't invest at the low end of the market. So the big funds are taking your money to invest in the top end of the market. They might be charging you a couple of percent to do so. And if you think the long-term you know, average return might be 10% on the stock market, it's like a quarter of your return. You're paying them to invest at the top of the market and pay their very expensive analysts to figure out which stocks to put you into. Mm. You're better off in an index fund perhaps. Yeah. Um, there is another book that I wanted to ask you about before we close out, which is The Richest Man in Babylon. Um, every personal finance book I've ever read traces back to The Richest Man in Babylon. George Klassen's book written in, I think I'm going to probably get this wrong, 1929. Um, why was that influential on you? Uh, I, I guess uh, I, I put that on the show notes for you because I just found it um, really – a, a very simple and clear way to to clar- codify what are good things to do in terms of investment. I mean, the number one rule is really easy. Spend less than you earn. Like if you follow that rule, spend less than you earn and you in- invest the leftovers, you're going to do well overall. Um, it's got a bit of a religious you know, tinge to it. So some of my friends haven't liked it. I'm kind of atheist, so it doesn't really factor for me either way. But I just think it's like a, a really simple... Uh, it's got some really simple guidelines and stories that um, mm. help you think about how to do well with money. Yeah, I can't remember who read this recently. Someone that I know read this recently and said, um, and he's an analyst. He said, he said, wow, this is like everything. Like this is like everything in one. And it was written so long ago. And it's true. Like if this is the book that, and it's so easy to read. It's such a small book. It's a little, the first chapter is a bit interesting. It's a bit different. But the rest of the book and talking about gold and keeping some gold, investing gold wisely, paying back the people that you owe money. Um, yeah, the lessons are timeless. So fantastic book. Um, there actually was one other thing, which I'm, I'm just remembering it now, which was I think it was about like how to negotiate. And I think um, – I can't remember the name of the book. Never yeah. split the difference. Yeah. I, I think that is the best 30 bucks everyone listening to this could spend immediately. Uh, it's a book by a former FBI hostage negotiator that talks how to talks about how to negotiate. And in every every single conversation in your life, you're negotiating. Mm. This is a negotiation <laughs> right now. Like and especially there are some really big important in negotiations when it comes to things like employment and whatnot, where it's really important to um, know what to do. And he really does a great job of codifying things like uh, mirroring. Yep. So I might say something you you might say yep and I might say yep. Uh, yep. Or, or you might say oh um Oh, how, how about that book? And I'll go, oh, yeah, that book, you know, repeat the words that you use. And then also labeling. So this um, this idea that when someone's speaking with you, you really want to demonstrate that you're actively listening and you also don't want to disagree with them. So you can reinforce their opinions. And when people hear their opinions being reinforced to themselves, they feel great about it. And so uh, words like, it sounds like you said, so-and-so or it seems like you said so-and-so or it looks like you're thinking so-and-so is just such a powerful way to communicate and there are all sorts of gems like that in that book i can't recommend it highly enough yeah um but a guy called brett kelly on the show recently um and he's kind of gone on this wonderful journey of his own and it comes back to working well with people and so i think that's this this advice this wisdom is something that these softer skills if you do have hard technical skills like you do such a good compliment for those so uh, the sooner you can pick them up the better so mate, i've got probably two more questions one is um if people want to find out more about you or follow along with your journey how do they do that um I'd rather stay relatively private, but, you know, stocklight.com, if you give me a five-star review, I will definitely buy you a beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you can follow him up separately with that. Hopefully, there's not a thousand people asking for a beer. I've got 5,000 beers waiting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So, and um, I guess that the next one is probably my favorite question. It's the last one. If you could go back and teach yourself or t- tell yourself something about money, finance, or investing, what would it be? Spend less than you earn. That's the big one to me. Spend less than you earn. Yeah, I'll just stick with that. That's my billboard. There you go. I like it. Great. Jason, thanks for taking some time to join me today. Great to see you again, Owen. Likewise.